taught and worked as an attorney for people with serious mental illness who are coming home from DC's prisons and jails. And I'm joined here by my colleague, Casey tonight. Hi, everybody. So like Emily said, my name is Casey Anderson. I've been facilitating CCE's justice education work and supporting Emily on several of our criminal justice projects for over two years now. Prior to joining CCE, I was a program associate at the Sentencing Project, supporting some of their research and advocacy initiatives. In 2019, CCE created the District Task Force on Jails and Justice to create a plan for the future of safety and corrections in DC. We have facilitated the task force work for over the past two years, and we're really excited to grapple with its recommendations tonight with all of you. Hi everyone, my name is Bailey Gilmore and I work for the National Reentry Network for Returning Citizens. We are a nonprofit member-based organization engaged in advocacy, training, and community building among DC returning citizens. I'm excited to share this time with all of you and my wonderful co-facilitators. Shout out to our members and staff and volunteers who are joining in tonight. It's great to have you here. Our members meet monthly to discuss issues and plan critical advocacy actions. If you want to get involved or learn more about what we do, I'll put my contact info in the chat. All right, y'all. So we are going to get to know each other. I'm going to share our mentee. I'm going to drop, I'm going to take over this. So if you could join us with your phone, um, you can go to menti.com, M-E-N-T-I, and use the code 9853-921. Um, and ask our co-facilitators to drop that code in the chat for folks. Let's see how many people are with us. Okay, so we have two people who've joined us. So I'm just gonna give you another moment. Um, this is just so we can get to know each other, know where we're at. There are a couple questions here. We have about 55 people in the room. So I'm gonna try and at least get to 15 to 20 folks on our mentee. Afini, do you think we can get to more? Absolutely. Um, just, uh, this is like a really important, um, for like demographics to know, like where you guys come from and just like, um, what your background is on all of this. Um, it's just very important for all of us being, be in community with each other, um, and know like where everybody's like standing at. So yeah, I think we can do it. <laughs> awesome. Yep. And we will be saving the information from this so that way we know how we can make um, our turnout and how we can make our facilitation better uh, for the rest of the month. Okay, so we've got 20. Um, if you're just joining us, please go to menti.com, use the code 985392 um, and drop the little dot and the where you're at so we can see. Awesome, so let's get going. All right, uh, let's go to the next one. Kia, do you wanna share the mentee slides so people can see? Oh, you can't see the mentee slides? We're still in the PowerPoint. Oh, I think, um, all right, that's a tech issue. I think the PowerPoint was supposed to come down at this point. Just give us one second. There we go. Awesome. Yeah, I was trying to share it. I thought y'all could see it. My bad. Wait, it's down again. It was up for a brief moment. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Now we can see. Uh, can everyone see? Yes. Awesome. All right. So we have, um, I'm going to pass it to the facilitator for these slides.
All right, so the where do you live in DC slide? Oh, there you go. Okay, we're on slide two. If you need, that's you. How long have you guys lived in DC? Um, again, super important demographic information just so we can know like what your experience is, um, possibly with MPD, um, knowing if you're impacted by um, DC and like the jail system out here. So it's um, important for us to just know that as well. So, and like, um, like my uh, uh, co-facilitator said, um, we will be keeping this information and uh, making, a, making it better for the next time. So. Average of 12 years, not bad. Um, all right, so the third question we have here, it asks about how you relate to the topics that we'll be learning about over these, this Teach-In series. Um, no one can see your individual response here, but we'd love for you to click all of the categories um, that apply to you, whether you're personally impacted um, because you have a history of incarceration or as a survivor of crime, um, whether a person you love has been impacted, whether you work in the field, um, you're here as a member of the DC community, or you're not sure yet, and you're here to learn more. Um, I want to note in particular, we're asking about history of incarceration or history of a, as a survivor of crime, because really for too long, um, you know, victims and offenders have been pitted against one another in this work, but we've learned so much. And we know that, first of all, these people aren't distinct, <laughs> um, right? These these groups, people who perpetuate harm and people who are harmed overlap so much. And that oftentimes um, they want the same things, accountability, repairing the harm, preventing future harm. Um, so that's one of the things that we're trying to learn about you tonight. It looks like we've got a lot of people in a lot of these categories here. Um, lots of people who might be newer the, to the topics, but a lot who either work or, or personally are impacted too. Thanks everyone. So now we sort of want to understand how you would rate your understanding or knowledge of DC's current jails and justice system with zero being no knowledge and 10 being that you are an expert in the field. Um, we are all showing up tonight uh, with the desire to talk about these issues and grapple with these issues and, you know, really think about these things critically, but we're also all showing up at you know, different levels of understanding. And I think that that is okay and is good to name. Um, everyone uh, who is here, we are excited to have here and we are excited to hear what you all have to say. Um, so if you could just rate your understanding of our current jails and justice system. I know it's one that people sort of have to think about. So it looks like we're falling a little bit in the middle, if I'm understanding this graphic correctly. That's a good place to be. Take a moment to share. What is one word or phrase that describes what safety or justice means to you and we'll see it all show up on the screen in a word cloud here in community freedom love and healing self-determined, community resources. This is awesome, thank you for sharing. A lot of the themes I'm seeing are themes that definitely came up in the task force community engagement work as well. And we can see how we all might have different understandings or there may be many words that bring up safety and justice to us.
So now we're going to transition back to our chat. Um, and so would love for you to drop in the chat right now. What is one thing you hope to learn during this teaching? this teaching series. Um, if you did not know, we are gonna be hosting this series. Um, we have three more nights. So every Tuesday um, for the rest of the month, um, we are going to be talking about the different recommendations um, that come out of the task force um, recommendation plan. And we're also gonna be hearing from you know other organizations in the city that have uh, similar recommendations and really struggling together about them. So please drop in the chat. Uh, what are some things you're hoping to learn? All right. So I'm seeing, oh, um, I'm seeing ways to advocate for reduction in car incarceration, um, actionable steps, uh, what is imp yep, a path towards abolition? Um, what's important to folks, to us on the call? I feel all of those things. Now, I also would like to take a moment. Um, we are gonna be talking about nitty gritty, um, you know, policy and recommendations, but we're also gonna be bringing up, um, you know, the impacts of the system that we live in. And I want for folks to know that this is not just theory. It's not just discussion and things to argue about. Um, this has uh, real life consequences. I um, in DC and in the DMV area, um, the Institute of Policing has taken away many people um, from our families. Um, and except the carceral system has separated families. It has rewritten people's histories um, and futures. And so we just want to take a moment to honor that and hold that, that what we talk about has um, emotional impacts and just uh, ask everyone to be present um, and to also take care of yourself. So we'll take a moment. Thank y'all for taking part in that moment of silence with me. Let's go to the next slide. Oh, is it still me? Okay, here we go. So, all right. So the goals for this series, um, we are looking to deepen our collective understanding. Um, before anyone could, you know, uh, appreciate or endorse a recommendation, we have to first understand it. So that's what um, this series is about. Um, we wanna build relationships across difference. Folks here are coming, as we saw in the who's here, uh, folks are coming from all different places and we wanna build relationships. We also wanna identify priorities. So I reached out to CCE um, and asked, you know, let's do this teaching series um, because, and working families party, which I'll talk about, it's really important that we have a platform um, that's connected to a strong ideology. And so um, information that you share tonight and also in our exit form are gonna help us identify our priorities. And I hope that it helps you figure out your priorities if you are also in an organizing space or coalition. So tonight is divest and invest. Um, next week, it's gonna be decarceration. Uh, the week after that, uh, local control of the criminal legal system. And then the last night is going to be facilities and services. And so you will hear from a different um, group of people. Um, well, most of us will be here every night, um, but we'll also have other organizations join us for subsequent nights. So now I get to talk to you a little bit about WFP. If you're not from WFP, if you um, came here through Twitter, through another partner, Working Families Party, um, we are people organizing together to win elections around a platform that's governed by a clear ideology. We are not an act, uh, a, a formal political party in DC, but we try and wedge ourselves in the places that the dominant parties maybe aren't supporting our people in. Um, and that's creating a political home. And so that's what tonight is about um, and what our organizing is about. 
we do that through five building blocks of power. So we're trying to build a mass base of WFP voters. We're trying to recruit and develop leaders with training and political education. Um, and we're trying to align people and also possess those top-notch electoral, electoral skills and exercise that ideological power. And so if you are interested, you can come to our community reunion on Thursday where you'll learn a lot more about WFP. And you can also sign our People's Charter, which is our roadmap, our North Star, um, for how we wanna move um, through the world and what we wanna fight for. So you would look at this work as the work that we do to care for the wrong, to repair historic harms and end systemic racism. Let's go. Also, it's good to note, Working Families Party is a part of the Defund MPD Coalition. Um, we have some Defund MPD Coalition members in the, um, in the room. Please feel free to drop in the chat. Let us know you're here. Um, you will see that Defund MPD has um, a roadmap and recommendations that are not exactly the same as the recommendations that you will hear tonight. You will have the opportunity to look at that roadmap and of course, join the WFP family and learn about our recommendations. Um, but overall, we're looking to reimagine safety um, with a just three year transition from policing, oppression and to care and freedom. When you look at, so you'll see my slides are purple, uh, but if you see that purple star on the top, where you see the purple star means that this recommendation is similar to a recommendation that defund MPD has, right? That's where the task force recommendations and defund MPD um, connect. And so if you see a star, that's what that means. And I'll talk a little bit more about what our uh, defund MPD recommendations are uh, later in the night. All right, so for our agenda tonight, uh, we're gonna overview the task force process. Um, we're gonna give some history um, and then talk about the recommendations. The breakout discussions are gonna be really important for us to hear what you think about these recommendations. Then we're gonna do a gallery walk of everyone's ideas from a jam board, and then we'll have the exit survey. It's important to note tonight's session is going to be pretty presentation heavy. The subsequent nights are gonna be more breakout sessions. We wanna make sure that you have the understanding and the history um, so that way you can understand the recommendations each night. So uh, come every night. All right, with that, we are going to do a quick overview um, of the District Task Force on Jails and Justice um, and how they got to be and how they came to their recommendations. Um, so this is the task force's vision you have up on the screen here. It was created in response to an effort by the DC government to solicit just designs for a new jail um, back in 2017 without any public input whatsoever. Um, advocates spoke up and said, hold on, you know, we have to get community involved in, with this process. And DC Council funded a grant through the Office of Victim Services and Justice Grants beginning in 2019 to build stakeholder engagement and solicit feedback related to the design and construction of a new correctional facility. Um, that was the grant language. But the task force, once, once it got together, uh, really interpreted this goal in the broadest possible terms. So task force members recognize that, you know, you can't have a discussion about a correctional facility without a total examination of the use of incarceration and the purpose of incarceration and our systems of safety and justice in DC. So the task force dedicated itself really to redefining DC's whole approach to justice and incarceration um, by building citywide engagement, centering the voices of people with lived experience, uh, understanding community priorities, and exploring the use and design of secure detention and community-based solutions. There were ultimately 26 task force members, including uh, people who have been previously incarcerated, government decision makers, academics and policy leaders, practitioners, service providers, advocates. And this task force, like we mentioned earlier, was facilitated um, by the Council for Court Excellence and the National Reentry Network for Returning Citizens. So in addition to its mission and vision, the task force also defined its core values. Um, these values guided task force members, uh, people who have very different experiences, expertise, and opinions uh, through complicated conversations and difficult decisions. 
the task force, recognizing that conversations about racism in the criminal justice system have long been silenced, explicitly committed to anti-racism in its work, where the information was available, all 80 recommendations in the phase two implementation plan detail their potential impact on DC's black population. As you probably suspect, and we'll hear more about in a minute, DC's modern criminal legal system was founded to reinforce slavery. Um, even now, Black people are drastically overrepresented at each stage of our system. The task force designed its recommendations specifically to help end the overcriminalization of Black people in DC. So during phase one, the task force engaged nearly 2,000 community members, analyzed jail data, and learned from other jurisdictions. That first report, Jails and Justice, a Framework for Change, was released in November 2019 and offered 17 high-level recommendations to guide reforms. Um, in phase two, the task force used those 17 high-level recommendations as the building blocks of its work and engaged 500 additional community members continued its research and made those rec recommendations actionable in the form of implementation plans. Um, task force members spent dozens of hours deliberating ideas and ultimately voted to publish Jails and Justice, Our Transformation Starts Today, um, its phase two report, and we're putting the link to that report in the chat now. So I think as you guys have gathered and I've alluded to, this new report is a, an 80-point implementation plan for district leaders to implement specific changes in laws, policies, and investments that will reduce the incarcerated population and improve the justice system in concrete and measurable ways um, with, with a specific focus on ending its disproportionate negative impact on Black residents. Um, it's also a toolkit that anyone can use to push for changes that they want to see in our system, and it will take all of us continuing to refine these recommendations and demand accountability for the implementations to get done. So here's just one example of what you'll see when you open up the report. Um, this is one of the 80 pieces of the implementation plan. Um, as you can see, we have a top line recommendation, and that's the part that at least 70% of the task force members voted in favor of. And then below that, we have an analysis of um, the type and the size of the outcome of the recommended change, including any impact on racial disparities or other special populations we could identify, uh, how we could, thought we could measure the success of the recommendations implementation. A uh, list of who needs to do what and when to make the change, and then estimated savings or costs of the change. Um, you know, we didn't have perfect information, but we filled in all of the data and where we could. And while the report's final, we're excited to keep adding information and refining these plans as we keep learning with you. Um, as a quick note for you research buffs and policy wonks, um, we decided not to include any references in the main implementation plan because it was already super dense and long. Um, so we kept all the footnotes and the resources and the supplemental memos. Um, and you'll find the committee reports and all of the data analyses contain those citations. Um, and the link is, is on the same page um, that's in the chat there. So you can find those if you're looking for them. The National Ranching Network for Returning Citizens led the community engagement work for the task force, including focus groups, community visioning workshops, and surveys, both online and in person, that touched about 2,500 DC residents, uh, 500 or so of whom were incarcerated either at DOC or BOP facilities when we connected with them. And I see that we have some people here tonight who were also part of those community engagement events as well. Hello and welcome. The task force learned an incredible amount about what community members think about safety and harm in their neighborhoods, about the failures of our current jails and justice system and about their vision for DC's future. So we'll be sharing those insights with you throughout this teaching series. Here are just a few highlights from what we learned that are most relevant for tonight's conversation on divesting and investing. And we'll touch on these more in the coming weeks as well. Of the nearly 1,800 DC residents we surveyed in 2019, the people who feel least safe here are those who have been incarcerated and are survivors of crime. 
70% of respondents do not think that incarceration is the best way to handle people who get arrested. And more than two thirds of respondents agreed that we should hold people in jail prior to conviction only if they pose a high risk to community safety. And in focus groups where we had space to dive more deeply into ways about ways to build safety, themes that we see here are those most often repeated. So housing security was identified as the root of many safety issues. We talked about how DC is over policed and people want to find alternatives to responding to the crisis community crisis, community empowerment, giving citizens a voice in community investments and decision making, support for youth, including focusing on education, behavioral health care, and jobs and economic opportunity, including connecting connections to living wage jobs for people in wards five, seven, and eight, especially people with criminal records. Okay, folks, so um, we heard from y'all at the beginning of the session today through that cool mentee um, that people have very different levels of knowledge about DC's criminal legal system. So we're going to take the next 20 minutes to walk through the history of our system here um, and where it stands today before we get started into you know, how we think it should be changed for the future. Um, I'd like to start with a history of the actual buildings, the correctional facilities. I am sure you're not shocked to hear that DC's jail and prison system is rooted in racism and has been through several generations of reform. Uh, we've had five facilities of our own, plus the Federal Bureau of Prisons, and none of these correctional institutions have ever solved the problems of the ones that came before them. And that's a lesson that the task force really took to heart. The first jail uh, in DC opened in 1838. It was nicknamed alternatively the, the blue jug because of the paint on the outside or the slave pen uh, because that's where alleged runaways were held. It has about 200 people when it was closed down and it actually is on a site that many of you all know, I'm sure, um, where the National Building Museum now stands. After that, um, they built the old DC jail and, and that was on the location where our jail still stands today um, out by RFK Stadium on Reservation 13. This facility was crowded after 20 years, but it was used for a century. Um, there was actually a presidential commission um, that Teddy Roosevelt ordered um, to clean up the facility and decided to create Lorton Penitentiary to fix it, but crowding persisted, overcrowding persis persisted. Um, in 1972, there was a jail uprising at that facility in the model of Attica, which had happened earlier that year. They ended up taking 12 hostages. Um, no one was killed and their demands were for freedom, um, not for better facilities. Um, but that eventually grew into two lawsuits um, that lasted almost 30 years and the construction of a new facility. Um, so this leads us to where we are now. We have two jail facilities in DC that are right next door to one another. CDF, um, the Central Detention Facility, or DC Jail as it's commonly called, um, opened in 1976. It's an old model that allows for very little visibility and safety. There's almost no programming space and it is physically falling apart. Um, it's full of mold. The HVAC and heat systems have a tough time keeping up. Um, there are issues with flooding and temperature control. Um, in school year 20, um, DC's budget proposal was included more than $77 million for repairs to this facility. Um, so it's really in, in very bad shape. Um, and everyone agrees on that. The other jail that we have right now is called CTF, um, the Correctional Treatment Facility. It opened in 1992 and was intended for uh, minimum and medium security, as a mi minimum and medium security facility for special populations, women, uh, people with substance use disorders. It ended up um, opening its doors right before DC was on the brink of bankruptcy. And so it, the city actually um, essentially sold the facility off to um, CCA or Core Civic, which was a private prison company, which controlled it for 20 years up until 2017 when that came back to district control. Um, that facility has is newer, it has more programming space. Um, DOC is doing some interesting programming over there now. Um, but it is a, a smaller and lower security facility. And now Lorton 
um, was closed in 2001 um, as the Revitalization Act and the Control Board came into being and a lot of our criminal justice system was federalized. Um, as of November 2020, um, so almost 20 years after Florida Head was closed, and everyone in DC who was sentenced to a year or more has now been sent out to federal prisons. Um, there were about 2,900 people spread between 122 different BOP prisons all across the country. Um, there have been as many as 4,000 people incarcerated at BOP in DC in very recent years. So our, our best estimation is that that number is lower now um, because of increased releases um, due to the COVID pandemic and also um, slower rates of trials and convictions. So not as many people are entering the system right now. Um, the next slide, I just wanted to show you a picture of the people who led the uprising at the jail in 1972. When we talk about the facilities, you know, you start thinking about bricks and mortars um, and locks and, and recentering re really on the people um, who are being forced to live in these facilities, because um, that's why we're here tonight. Casey? Sure. Um, sorry, I thought someone had something that they wanted to say after uh, this slide. Um, sorry, y'all. Um, I just wanted to say one quick thing and also where we want to make sure we honor folks' time. Um, I just to let you know that when we're talking about adv advocating, um, that there isn't this idea of the only type of advocacy that can happen is outside. Um, the folks, our folks who are inside are uh, capable um, and deserve uh, support so that they can advocate for themselves and they can make their own uh, recommendations. Um, and I think that is some of the spirit of the community engagement part of this process. Um, but I just really love that you here because I think that's important when we're doing this work. Thank you for that um, very important reminder. Uh, as we've talked about, and as I am sure many of you um, here tonight are aware of, uh, this legacy of DC's criminal legal system is racist, but our current system is also racist. Uh, Black people make up 47% of DC's population, but 86% of the people that we arrest, 92% of the people that we jail, and 95% of the people in prison serving DC code sentences. So thinking about that in the bigger picture, how many people are in the system? Um, in 2017, one in 22 or 4% of all adults in DC were justice involved on any given day. One in seven adults in DC have some publicly available criminal record and one in 14 have a conviction on their record. Um, you can see here that our jail and parole and supervised release populations have been slowly, steadily declining for years following a similar trend in the US, um, but our arrest and probation rates started climbing back up in 2016. Oh, um, all right. Hey, y'all, so I'll just quickly talk a little bit about policing, um, just give a little background since our recommendations talk about policing. How many police do we have? We got about 4,000 sworn police officers in MPD alone. Um, there are over 37 different police departments. So that's from housing to federal to libraries. Um, it also makes us the highest, um, most police uh, city in the country. Um, we have the highest police per capita compared to large cities. We're ahead of Chicago and New York City. And here's just some data that you'll um, we can share with you afterwards. Um, the piece about this is to know that um, the use of force um, as reported by MPD is extensive. We know that force is being used about six times a day. Um, there are about 1,200 reported use of force incidents. And the reason why those numbers are different is because each use of force is like, you could have multiple uses of force in one incident. So someone could be handcuffed, someone could be kneed, someone could be grabbed, and all of that happening in one incident. Um, the numbers show that more than one in three officers are reporting use of force. Um, uh, and 
we know that this disproportionately impacts Black people. Um, out of anyone shot at in 2019, they were all Black people. Go to the next slide. All right. Um, so we are running a little bit behind here. And for the sake of time, I'm going to skip through the data section. Um, again, for those of you who are <laughs> who want the meat and the numbers, um, we will be sharing the slide deck. And this is also all in the report. We grabbed these um, graphs right from the report. So the Department of Corrections population here, um, you can see there are a lot of people in our jails. Um, we're hovering around 1,200, 1,300 people right now in this post-COVID reality. Um, it, the jail holds people who are unsentenced, so who are be being held before their trial, before they're convicted. Um, it holds uh, some people who are sentenced, some people who are facing revocations of their parole or their probation or their supervised release. Um, and then we also hold people for other jurisdictions or they're on federal charges or for Maryland or Virginia. I am going to skip um, the next couple of slides that we have, but we have information on people's top charges, on how long they stay at the jail. Surprise, Black people have to stay longer. Um, and among, on the um, prevalence of substance use um, and mental illness in the jail, um, we have more than 60% of people in our facilities that have behavioral health issues. Um, the BOP population is different in a lot of ways um, because people are there for much longer on much more serious sentences. Um, but if you look at the next slide, it's, it's not that different. It's still overwhelmingly black and overwhelmingly male, the, who we send out to the federal Bureau of prisons. Um, and we have some information here for you on um, top charges on the next slide as well. Um, but for now, I think, do we still have time to take our break? Are we okay with that? I think we've been moving a bunch. I think it's solid to still take a break. Um, I'm gonna give folks uh, just on, some time to journal on the things that you've heard. I'm gonna play some music um, and facilitators can do a quick huddle. Yep. And if you have questions, if you wanna drop them in the chat now, um, we can help address those too. Thank you all. All right, all right, y'all. Um, love for you if you are in the vicinity to start coming back. Also, please excuse the sirens. It's, uh, I live near a firehouse. <laughs> um, while we were away, I got a really good question asking, does this work include mental health facilities? I work at Elizabeth Hospital Behavioral Facility and it's a prison with a different name. So the district task force on jails and justice did not look at St. Elizabeth's. Um, CCE has done some of that overlap work for what they call like the forensic population, um, people who are held um, against their will at St. Elizabeth's, um, sometimes purely for mental health reasons, sometimes for, for criminal case reasons. Um, but the, that was not addressed here. It's a good question. All right, so we're gonna to go to our first facilitator. So this week, uh, we're focusing on defund MPD, the task force's recommendations that involve divesting from traditional criminal justice system functions like policing um, and incarceration and reinvesting those funds to evidence-based programs that build community safety. So before we get started, um, and go over those specific recommendations, let's talk about the different models for investment. Um, so the first one is reinvestment. And there, the idea is um, that you're changing policies and practices that cause the city to spend less on the traditional criminal legal system and um, you use those savings to fund community initiatives and resources. The second model is divest invest. Um, and with direct divest invest, that process, um, you are intentionally shifting resources away from traditional law enforcement and towards community organizations that promote safety and well-being. 
Um, initiatives under this model seek to reverse the harm caused by the systemic racism by diverting the funds away from incarceration and policing and towards social services and organizations. This model has been lifted up by the Black Lives Matter movement in recognition of the urgent need to shift resources towards expanded opportunity and stability for the Black community. Um, and then finally, we have upfront investments, and that is generating new funds um, through a tax or a bond to support community investments. The task force doesn't call for any upfront investments, um, but increasing taxes on the wealthy is a part of the budget and the COVID recovery conversation in DC right now. The task force does have many recommendations that call for changes to policy and practice that will result in less spending on uh, traditional law enforcement and incarceration and that those funds can then be reinvested. Um, but today we're just gonna focus on the recommendations that call for direct divest investment. All right, y'all, uh, let me bring up, oh, all right, she's gone. Um, so Afini, when you're ready, uh, just turn your camera on and, okay, there we go. All right, y'all, so um, how much money they got? A lot, okay, 545.7 million. I'm sure that number is mixed. If you even wanna add in the $43 million they reprogrammed last year, um, they got a lot of money. They got a lot of money to abuse people. They got a lot, they pulled, and that same $43 million that um, they just brought up was taken from public housing and the Department of Health during a pandemic. Um, so. <laughs> All right. And the thing is, what's important to know that when you're looking at divest recommendations, there is, in, WFP understanding and defund and PD understanding that there is no way to truly divest from police without decreasing the size of the force. When people talk about divesting or defund the police, we, we need to understand that we've been doing that to education, to health, to jobs for years. This is not actually this new idea of divestment. Um, we are just uh, keeping our eye on really at the root causes of our issues. Um, you know, especially considering that a lot of the money that gets pulled away from, you know, pu public services, a lot of the money gets pulled away from social services in these black neighborhoods goes to the police for them, for them to over police and abuse black people like they like they were saying earlier over 80% of the arrests that happen in DC are black people. Um, so we should not be giving them more money and we should not be increasing the force just for them to not properly do their jobs or not for not actually care about public safety. One thing I want you to remember before we go to the uh, next section, in 2019, $900,000 went to five officers combined, right? Five officers, their overtime was $900,000 and that was on top of their salaries. Um, and so the need to divest is gonna have to be cutting personnel costs and decreasing the size of the force. Let's get next one. So just going to share, just here some, if you are interested in defund MPD, um, you can go to bit.ly defund MPD 21. Um, defund is actually lowercase. Uh, my font did not allow me to do that. Um, so, uh, but essentially defund is looking at uh, cutting half of the budget um, as a path to abolition. Um, we're looking at cutting contracts. So we're trying to cut MPD's contracts with schools, trying to cut contracts with um, behavioral health programs, um, try to end some contracts of either other departments like the police and housing. We wanna invest in community. We wanna invest in community this budget. We wanna invest in community in the future as well. Um, we cannot wait um, for the police to be completely defunded for us to start investing in alternatives. All right. We want to pass laws to protect us from harm. Um, and some of those can look like um, protecting us from the harm of police brutality, of over sur of surveillance. Um, and then uh, if you need, feel free to hop on whenever you want to. Um, also so taking money away from the police is specifically so we can start to invest into non-carceral, non-violent um, alternatives like violence interruption um, or like clinical, like clinical workers to come and deal with mental health um, issues and not 
bad boys with guns <laughs> um, because um, our idea of safety and um, what protection look like protection looks like is inherently harmful, especially black communities, especially to the black community of DC that is being that is being violently pushed out of their neighborhoods anyway. Um, so it is very important that not only are we um, passing these laws and all these things, but we're also focusing on uh, building up the programs that are, that are going to replace the, po the police um, and their their job descriptions. And so set our people free. That's like we actually want to let get people out of jail. So that's um, decarceration and decriminalization. We need to decriminalize sex work. We need to decriminalize uh, street vending. We need to decriminalize poverty in itself. And we're also calling on the uh, council to start leading bravely. But you can learn more about that um, at the link. Let's go to the next one. All right. Um, so the task force's recommendations align in many ways with defund MEDs, but not in all of the ways. Um, again, those stars are going to highlight where um, there's a lot of connection between the two. Um, what the task force recommended was re reducing MPD's budget by up to $140 million a year um, for the first five years here. So a slower start than what defund MPD is calling for. Um, it would do this by disbanding the school safety division and terminating the school safety contract, which are on the same page, um, significantly reducing crowd control supply budget and funding for military style equipment, um, and then reducing the patrol force by 25%. Um, this can sound like a lot, <laughs> but really MPD's attrition alone has been between four and 10% of its officers every year um, for the last six years. So if we just replace at a slower rate, we can draw down um, without making immediate cuts to officers and their jobs. Uh, the task force recommends two other things to, to move money away from MPD. Um, one is moving civil traffic enforcement, um, speeding tickets, that type of thing, from MPD to the DC's Department of Transportation, DDOT, which already does parking enforcement. Um, and the second is ending the use of MPD as first responders for everything. Um, they get sent out on all 911 and 311 calls right now. And the task force wants to see, um, as we'll talk about a little bit more later, um, behavioral health crisis responders and other specialized people responding to calls that don't require so that someone with a gun be showing up. Um, the task force, I do want to mention too, debated recommending a total defund of DC's other law enforcement agency, the DC Housing Authority Police, um, but really felt like it didn't have enough information about what public housing residents actually wanted um, to make that recommendation. So instead it asked for part of the, that force's $4.3 million budget to go toward engaging residents of public housing in a consultative process um, to design safety interventions um, that they want to see to increase public safety through non-law enforcement strategies. The other big law, uh, law enforcement agency in DC um, that we locally pay for and run is the Department of Corrections. Uh, DOC's operating budget has increased nearly every year for the last decade. Um, and, and over the last 10 years, the total budget went up by 25%. Um, the number of full-time employees there also increased every year and has gone up 50% during that time period. Um, and, and at the same time that, that intakes, the number of people who walk in through the jail's doors um, has decreased by 40%. Um, and the average population at um, DOC has, has decreased by about the same amount. So given that we're spending more money and, and serving fewer people, um, the spending per incarcerated person has, has really blown out of proportion over time. Um, we right now, or excuse me, in FY 2018, in fiscal year 2018, we're spending $241 per day to incarcerate a person, um, which is an average of $88,000 per year to incarcerate someone at DC jail or CTF. Um, the task force calls for reducing the number of correctional officers over the next 10 years as we have even fewer people incarcerated and as supervision styles are changed. Um, we'll talk more about the recommendations to decarcerate and the recommendations about the facilities themselves in coming week sessions. 
Um, for now, we're focusing really on where we'll find the money um, to reinvest from DOC. So I'm gonna give you an overview of the investment portion of those recommendations from the task force. So among those recommendations are expanding the use of violence interrupters to reduce violent crime in the district, reduce the over-policing of criminalization and criminalization of DC's black residents and increase public safety. This recommendation will largely benefit residents of Northeast and Southeast DC neighborhoods with the highest rates of gun violence. And the recommendations call for recurring funding for the DC Office of the Attorney General's Cure the Streets program and the Office of Neighborhood and Safety Engagement Violence Intervention Initiative, excuse me, the Office of Neighborhood Safety and Engagement. So from fiscal year 22 on, the DC Council should allocate additional recurring funding to build, purchase, or renovate an affordable housing or mixed population housing complex. The council should allocate additional recurring funding for locally funded housing vouchers and allocate both locally funded and federally funded housing vouchers for development projects. And the third one I'll highlight is DC public schools should build partnerships with community-based organizations that facilitate programs that build and maintain school safety, including transformative and restorative justice, violence interruption, or mentorship. Um, an overview of the investments in interventions. So investing in continued training for DC's educators on social emotional learning and trauma informed approaches, investing in school programs that use transformative justice approaches. And as previously mentioned, the recommendations call for investment in violence interrupters who can disrupt the cycles of violence and support youth success. Um, also drawing on what Emily was talking about, updating our 911 and 311 systems so that the community response team can respond to crises, crises in which a person is likely to want or need a behavioral health intervention instead of police or in conjunction with police. So in phase two, we also had the opportunity to survey people serving DC sentences in the BOP, specifically about reentry. Um, and this survey was done in large part to the dedicated work of Bailey and the team at the National Reentry Network. Um, but survey respondents' top three concerns about reentry were getting health care, finding a job, and getting community trust and support. Over 70% of respondents indicated some or a lot of worry about these issues. Nearly half of those who will be released within five years are worried about getting mental health care treatment, some or a lot. And one third are worried about getting substance use treatment, some or a lot. The implementation plan promotes entrepreneurship programming for returning citizens, peer support and mentoring opportunities for returning citizens at community-based organizations, funding more grants to support community-based reentry services, funding reentry specific low barrier housing, um, and the immediate connection um, to high quality behavioral health services upon release from incarceration. All right, we about to break out. All right, so this, we've been talking at you for over for an hour now, and we want y'all to talk to each other um you are going to go into some breakout rooms and i know this is usually a time when people be like spongebob meme i'm out but this is the most important part um we want to know what recommendations uh do you think were good or exciting what recommendations would you change how what's missing what do we want to learn from what do we want to learn more about and you, in your breakout room, you're going to have a facilitator, one of us, or the wonderful Natasha, who's also in the crowd with us. 